This is Epicenter, episode 395 with guest Roman Semenov. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Quitu, and I'm here with Felike Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Roman Semenov. He's the co-founder of Tornado Cash. It's a fully decentralized protocol for private transactions on Ethereum. But before we talk to Roman, uh, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. Exodus is an easy-to-use wallet which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all platforms, including iOS and Android. It's fully non-custodial, and they're firm believers of not your keys, not your coins. Go to exodus.com and give it a try. Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap, and it comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance, Smart Chain, and you can start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. And Solana is a next-generation blockchain with lightning-fast blocks and fees less than one cent per transaction. Scalability is perhaps the biggest single challenge preventing crypto from becoming the backbone of the financial system. Go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. So Raman, thanks for joining us today. Tell us a bit about yourself. What's your background and how did you get involved in crypto? My background is uh, I learned, uh, studied physics <laughs> originally, but then I got into programming, uh, founded a few startups, web services. Then I got into blockchain, I think four years ago. Worked on uh, Ethereum scalability solutions. At this time, it was Plasma, but then switched to ZK Snarks, and privacy. What did you do in physics? I'm a physicist by training also. It's uh, quantum statistics and field theory. So the black holes, small particles, and all this stuff. When you um, got started on the privacy side of Ethereum applications, what kind of drew you to that? I started by learning uh, ZK Snarks uh, to do some scalability stuff. And they can also be applied to oracles and other things but one of the main applications are is privacy so i've built a few privacy projects on ethereum hackathons and then we just decided to build something for production the thing that you built for production was tornado cash right so tell us about tornado cash in a in a nutshell so we'll dive deep into how it actually works in a bit but um what problem is it that tornado solves the privacy, because by default, all Ethereum transactions are public and not many people are comfortable with all their like financial history being public. So it solves this problem. Can you describe in a nutshell how that works? How do I make my transaction not public? If you have a Ethereum wallet, if you just transfer some funds to a new wallet, uh, the wallets can be connected. Like everyone can see that funds went to this new address. But with Tornado Cash, uh, you can put your funds uh, into Tornado Pool. And when you do this, uh, Tornado Cash generates a private node for you. This node will be used to access your funds later. It's kind of similar to a private key. Then when you want to withdraw, you generate a new address and use this private node to withdraw your funds to this new address. And nobody will see how your old address is connected to a new one. The way I see Tornado Cash is it's like this black box where you throw funds into it. And then on the other end, you can withdraw funds. And there's no way of knowing where those transactions are connected because you know they're, everything's obfuscated by the cryptography in Tornado Cash. Can you walk us through some of the like usage scenarios? Like, what does a user use Tornado Cash for? Like, who are your users? If you want to get a new identity on blockchain, uh, you can put your some of your funds to Tornado Cash pool, then withdraw to your fresh address, and use it uh, for some things that you don't want uh, to be connected with your previous identity. When people deposit into Tornado Cash, uh, they're given a, a zero-knowledge-based note um, that allows them to withdraw as much as they put in minus a fee. This kind of hinges on the fact 
um, that other people use that service as well. So right. So basically, if if I'm the only one who uses Tornado Cash, it's no good because everyone knows exactly one person put money in and exactly one person pulled money out. So what do you recommend to users of Tornado Cash? So I assume it's advisable to leave to not withdraw immediately after depositing. Correct. Uh, you can imagine Tornado Cash Pool as a bag of coins that are all the same and some people come along and throw a new coin into this bag and then some other people come and take the coin, take some coins from this bag. So there is some activity like people come and go, but uh, for example, if someone puts a coin into this bag and then someone else immediately takes coin out, someone can think that probably this is like the same person. It is better if you mix with the crowd. So uh, you put your funds into the pool, wait until at least few more people interact with this pool, and then take some funds out. So basically, it's better to use the protocol when there's like a lot of noise to kind of obfuscate the lineage between your, your deposit transaction and your withdrawal transaction. Yeah. And there are also fixed denominations, right? So basically, there's different pools for different increments of tokens. Yeah, and those pools are completely separate. Uh, this is done because, uh, for example, if we would allow uh, any amounts, if you put some specific amount like 1.33 Ether in there and then take out the same amount, people can see that probably this is like the same user. So what's the typical daily volume that goes through your protocol and how many um, users interact with it? It's usually dozens. Uh, you can check the actual stats on the... We have the Dune Analytics dashboard. Uh, it can be accessed from Tornado Cash app. It's in the main menu. But basically, it's uh, dozens of transactions for each pool. And the total number of transactions are around like 10,000 plus, plus. And which tokens do you support? So I assume Ether is supported, but um, what about other tokens? Ether is the most popular one, and uh, it provides the best anonymity set. But uh, Tornado Cash also supports uh, DAI, CDAI, and Wrapped BTC. And people can also use those, but there are fewer users, so less anonymity at the moment. I assume this only works for tokens which are reasonably liquid, right? So basically where there's um, quite a lot of demand for obfuscating the origin of these coins. Do you have um, an idea of how to extend that to less liquid coins? The easiest solution is you can exchange less liquid coins to Ether, use Tornado Cash for Ether, and then you can exchange back to those coins. Basically, the assets that are chosen for Tornado Cash pools are the ones where people want to hold their funds. For example, if a user wants to hold their funds a long time in Tornado Cash, uh, maybe someone is not comfortable holding ETH and more comfortable holding stable coins. Uh, for example, some users don't want to be exposed to ETH volatility. They can use DAI pool to put their money there for a few months, for example. Is there a way, have you thought of, I don't know, like technically how feasible this is, but for the Tornado Cash smart contract to also include, uh, in addition to the privacy aspect, some sort of automated market maker uh, type of application that would allow users to basically swap tokens. So like you could have like one person with depositing ETH and wanting to withdraw DAI and you could have maybe like another in the same pool wanting to do the inverse and you could just basically kind of like have those users like uh, swap their tokens for one another? It's not easy to do this uh, while preserving privacy. So uh, automated market makers are not very friendly with like privacy solutions uh, because for example in solution that you described uh, those two Assets can change their relative value. For example, when you deposit it, they worth like the same, but maybe when you withdraw, one of them are now 10 times more expensive. And it will be hard to do this like matching and exchange. 
Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat, and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. So let's talk about um, how Eternity Cash works under the hood. So we already mentioned that there's different pools, like for 1, 10, or 100 ETH. Talk about the smart contract and the particular zero-knowledge technologies that Tornado Cash uses. I wanted to ask you how deep do you want to go? This is a fairly technical podcast. You can go technical. So there are basically two actions, deposit and withdraw. Uh, There is also anonymity mining, but we can talk about this later. Uh, When you deposit, the front-end generates some random bytes, to be precise, like 62 bytes, but that doesn't matter. Like some random array of bytes computes their hash and sends your ETH along with this hash to the smart contract. It calls deposit function. And then smart contracts inserts this hash into the Merkle tree. And the hash function is used Pedersen hash. It's more snark friendly than regular SHA-3 or whatever. And then the interesting part happens when you withdraw like deposit is simple but it's quite expensive because this hash function is pretty expensive in solidity in since you insert in the merkle tree you need to compute a lot of those but the operation itself is somewhat simple when you withdraw the front end takes the same uh, array of bytes and splits it in two the first part is called secret and the second part is called nullifier. This time we hash only this last part, nullifier hash, and using the snark, we prove that uh, we can take this random array of bytes, your key, and if we hash all of it, uh, we get your commitment. And if we hash only the second part of it, we get your nullifier. And also it proves that uh, this commitment the hash of all this key, is present in the Merkle tree of deposits. So the inputs for snarks is Merkle root. When you're using zero knowledge, some inputs are private and some inputs are public. The public inputs are sent on chain to check them against some smart contract data. And private inputs are only present when the user generates snark proof. So the public input is Merkle root and smart contract will check that Merkle root used for this snark proof is the same that he has on the smart contract, like for tree of deposits. Merkle path is private. So the external observer only sees that the node is present in this Merkle tree, but doesn't know where exactly it is located, which leaf exactly it is. And also smart contract can verify that all hashes were computed correctly because it is proven with this snark. Also, hash of the second part, nullifier hash, is also public. And it is used to prevent double spends. When user withdraws funds, the smart contract uh, verifies that this nullifier hash is not present already in this array of nullifier hashes. And if it is present, then it means the same node was already withdrawn. And interesting part is that nullifier hash is not cannot be linked to commitment to hash of all this value because those are computed from different bytes and uh, they seem completely random to external observer. 
So you already alluded to the fact that these transactions are pretty costly on chain. Can you give us an idea of how much um, they cost at, say, 100 Gwei? So deposit costs uh, a little bit more than 1 million of gas. Uh, so this will be, it depends on Ether price too, but I guess like $200 or something like this. And withdrawal is cheaper. Uh, withdrawal only computes, like verifies snark proof and it costs around 400,000 gas. You can only withdraw in the same increments that you've put in, right? You can't just say, I'll put in 100 ETH and then I'll just withdraw a 0.1 of an ETH or one ETH whenever I need one ETH. You have to uh, deposit and withdraw the same increments. Exactly, yeah. With current implementation, yes. Is there um, a plan to make this more efficient? Because obviously depositing at, say, 200 ETH euros per transaction or $200 per um, deposit is pretty expensive and only pays for a pretty large sum. So basically, if I want to um, obfuscate, say, $100,000, that may be worth it. But, if it. but if it's only one ETH or something, it's probably unfeasible, right? Yes, there are uh, many ways to improve the current solution. Uh, when we developed Tornado Cash, uh, we were thinking about what the simplest solution we can make to solve privacy and roll it out to mainnet faster. But now we are thinking about how we can made, make this convenient <laughs> and cheap. So currently Tornado Cash solves privacy in the simplest but not very easy to use way. There are many ways to improve it. For example, it can be done more similar to Zcash with transactions inside the shielded pool. So to allow users to deposit any amount uh, into the pool, do transactions to some other users. Like for example, you can deposit three ETH, send one ETH to someone else privately, then withdraw one ETH or whatever. And also using layer two technology, it can be made much cheaper than it currently is. And uh, this privacy pool will be, can be very layer two friendly, I'd say, uh, because since you already need to enter the privacy pool and then exit the privacy pool when you are done, you can in the same transaction basically enter layer two as well. With uh, good enough integrations, privacy can be done in such a way that you deposit funds, deposit funds into the privacy pool and magically all transactions inside this privacy pool are done already on layer two and are cheap and fast. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that you could deposit funds into Tornado Cash and then those funds would essentially come out into in a layer two. Does that mean that you would need to have different pools for every uh, layer two solution? Or uh, would there be a way to somehow have like one big pool that like sends funds in one of several layer twos, which would kind of like increase privacy, I guess? It will result in a separate anonymity pool for each uh, layer two, because uh, it's very hard to synchronize different layer two solutions and prevent double spends. For example, if someone sends funds in one layer two and then send the same funds in different layer two, it will likely result in the different pools. I have a couple more technical questions as to how the protocol actually works. Um, so when I withdraw from the pool um, after having waited, say, a couple of days, I would use a fresh address, right? Because, I mean, this is kind of the point of all of this. How do I pay for gas from a fresh address, right? Because basically, if it's a fresh address, I, I won't have any ETH to pay for gas. So how is this handled? For this, we have a relay network. And basically uh, how this works is instead of sending your snark proof uh, and all the call data to Ethereum, you send the same data to Relayer and Relayer submits this for you on chain and then gets part of your deposit as a compensation. All the parameters, uh, including Relayer fee and which Relayer should receive it, are included in snark proof. So if anything 
changes in this data, the snark proof becomes invalid. So a uh, relayer cannot change anything. And the worst thing that it can do is just don't do its job and like don't send a transaction, in which case you just like choose a new one. But this is a pretty rare occasion because uh, if relayers misbehave, they will just get deleted from UI. So when you're looking for a flight, you go to a flight aggregator to see all the different places where you can buy the flight, to get all the options and make sure you get the best price for your travel plans. And when you're making a DeFi swap, just do the same and use Paraswap. It beats the market prices across all the major DEXs because it aggregates them. And thanks to their network of professional market makers, you get zero slippage on your trades. So they just pushed a huge update that's even faster, more liquid, thanks to a brand new algorithm. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So go and check it out. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. So last year, um, a paper came out, an academic paper, on misuses of Tornado Cash, or basically user faults, mostly, where they looked at the 3,000 um, Tornado Cash deposit and withdrawals until that date and found that through just looking at the graph, they could actually match up 400 of these, basically because people used um, the same deposit and withdrawal address. Uh, people uh, did these immediately one after the other and so on. So this is already quite a large chunk of users that maybe some of these were test transactions, but I assume some of the, the users genuinely messed up. Do you think you could make it easier for people to use this correctly? Or do you think you could make it harder for people to mess up? And we all know this is really difficult because people like messing up. For this article, I, I think like the most of the uh, transactions that withdraw to the same address were probably just tests. But in general, I agree, we need to educate people better on how to correctly use uh, Tornado Cash to preserve privacy. But the best way to solve this would be to make a wallet that takes care of all those things for the user. For example, the most obvious thing is um, hiding IP address because IP can be considered uh, public information. All those intermediate internet service providers and uh, many other nodes in the network can see it. And wallet could submit all the requests through Tor, for example. And also, like the wallet is the would be the most convenient way to solve this, but it's a lot of work. So you also need to connect to um to an Ethereum endpoint, right? So basically, most wallets actually just um, connect to Infura. So basically, Infura, if you don't mask your IP, they they typically know who you are and uh, which transactions you've sent to the network, right? Yes, um, for users, it's correct to assume that everyone knows their IP address unless they use VPN or something like this. But if you just want uh, to prevent your neighbor from looking inside your wallet, it can be fine. So, like uh, every user decide for himself which level of anonymity does he wants, like whether he wants to just hide his financial history from general public or he maybe doesn't trust governments at all and want nobody to be able to see his uh, financials. The project goes uh, at length uh, when you're like on the website and, and reading the documentation. It, it really goes at length to ensure that every aspect of Tornado Cash uh, is decentralized. So there are no like admin keys to administer the smart contract. Uh, the website and the interface are hosted on IPFS and there's like all of this uh, documentation around like how the project aims to be fully decentralized. What kind of constraints does this impose uh, on you as a developer and perhaps also on users? And was there ever you know, a thought that you, perhaps you should do this also as like an anonymous founder? Or was this ever uh, considered? And if not, uh, why not? Anonymous founders, uh, making it as anonymous is uh, harder because... Um, it's harder to hire and people basically trust way less to anonymous funders than public figures. 
as for uh, immutable smart contracts, it introduces a lot of complexity, but uh, users trust more when they see that uh, the system cannot be changed. For example, one of the difficulty we had is introducing anonymity mining, because if the contracts would be still updatable, the anonymity mining would be much, much simpler. But since we couldn't change uh, already existing smart contracts, uh, we had to introduce quite a few new mechanisms to work around this. Which new mechanisms? For example, there is some intermediate step. Um, the Tornado Cache smart contract, like core smart contracts, don't save uh, at which block uh, each deposit was made. And for anonymity mining, this information is needed to compute the reward size because it's based on time uh, the deposits spent in the pool. So uh, we had a separate contract that contains Merkle tree of all deposits and all withdrawals, but with block number information. So it mostly duplicates the core smart contract state, but it's like extra stuff. And also someone needs to upload updates to this tree. It is done trustlessly, so you cannot upload incorrect information, but still someone has to do it and pay for gas. What's the role of the torn token? I mean, you use that for anonymity uh, incentivization or anonymity mining, right? Torn token is used for making governance decision for Tornado Cash protocol. And uh, currently there are a few ways to get torn. Um, old users uh, got torn as airdrop. So uh, the people that used Tornado Cash in the past before Torn Token was released, got their Torn voucher that they can change to Torn Token. And new users uh, get Torn Tokens as a reward via anonymity mining. So basically, Torn Tokens are distributed to users that use Torn Cash in the past and in present. So people that use it the most have the most voting power in the governance. And what kind of um, governance decisions does the DAO take? There were some uh, proposals, uh, for example, to update anonymity mining mechanism because uh, at the moment of release, it was too expensive and basically broken because it cost too much. But then the more efficient one was developed that is 10 times cheaper in terms of gas. And governance was used to deploy this uh, new contract and migrate all the data there. Also, there was proposal for new pools, new bigger pools for DAI, CDI, and WBTC were introduced. And currently there is one uh, more active proposal uh, to do a community fund for Tornado Cash. So community decided to set up a multisig to be able to quickly make some decisions that don't need this big governance voting, but basically like it's smaller decisions than governance usually makes. And uh, I need to know that uh, Tornado Cash team doesn't have a vote in its own governance because uh, all team tokens are undervesting. So currently community makes all these uh, decisions without us. How long is, are the tokens rested for? It's for three, three years, but first cliff, like first unlock, is uh, after one year. So this would be around December. So this community pool, what kind of, uh, of initiatives or like, applications do you hope to see uh, this pool funding? I think they want to reward some contributors to Tornado Cash uh, ecosystem. So maybe some people that write manuals or make videos or maybe even sponsor hackathons or something like this. Let's get to our sponsor, Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. 
and the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solano ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. And so tell us a little bit about this ecosystem, like what exists out there in the Tornado Cash ecosystem and what kind of things would you like to see develop? Because it seems like a pretty, I mean, to me anyways, it seems like a pretty straightforward thing. Like it's an anonymity pool, but what kind of things can we build on top of that? There are a few simple things that come to mind, like uh, not a solution, but more like uh, we like documentation, for example. <laughs> uh, so some things, uh, like some simple things are needed to be done. Uh, but in terms of uh, more complex, there are a few proposals about how to manage change or some people call it dust. For example, if you withdraw one ether and then spend half of it for something, now you have half ether sitting in some address and you can't do much with it like you cannot uh, make it private again uh, and everything you do with it will be connected with your previous transactions that that spent this half ether uh, so there are a few proposals how to make those like small pieces private again so one of the things that I thought was really interesting uh, on the Trinity Cast website is the the compliance tool. When I saw it, it's like, is, are they talking about regulatory compliance or the, is there some other form of compliance that uh, I'm not getting here? But yeah, it, it is uh, a tool to uh, sort of you know ensure that transactions and special users can be compliant with um, their local um, tax regulation. What's the compliance tool and why did you choose to uh, build this into Tornado Cash? Compliance tool allows to prove the link between deposit and withdrawal. And basically, it gives a Tornado Cash user a freedom to uh, disclose his information to someone. So the financial information is not forced to be like completely hidden. And user has now power to decide who they want to see this information. For example, if they want to send those private funds to an exchange and then exchange asks them about origin of funds or something like this they can easily prove where the funds come from and pass all this check this can be used for tax compliance or kyc or things like this but nobody except the user uh, has the power to disclose it yeah, I remember a while ago there were exchanges who weren't allowing users to um, send mixed tokens to them. For, I think it was an issue with with them, the Wasabi wallet and Binance, but I'm sure there were also other exchanges who put similar measures in place. Is that correct? I'm actually not aware about this, so can't really comment much, but I didn't hear about like mass restrictions of like this. When you use this compliance tool, I guess as a user, you provide some sort of, of an attestation that will allow a third party to read the information about the origin of the transaction. Doesn't that sort of open up a vulnerability, though, where by sharing it with one user, you effectively open the possibility for this information to be made fully public? Because once you've shared it with one user, that or that this other party, that other party can effectively share that information with the world and thus making transaction anonymity in Tornado Cash obsolete. How does one protect themselves against attack on their privacy? And I mean, is it? am I even correct in assuming that this is the case? This is correct. So the best way would be to only share your private information to other people you trust, <laughs> that they don't leak it. Most people will probably use this, you know, in the case of like exchanges requesting uh, some sort of origin of funds for KYC or 
uh, for tax purposes or something like that, or things like that. So it's, it assumes that you have to sort of trust that these third parties are either not going to get hacked or um, won't uh, disclose the information. Yeah, correct. I'm curious, are you familiar with uh, the um, upcoming uh, Mika regulatory proposal in Europe and the provisions in there for sort of privacy coins and uh, anonymous transactions? Mm, nope. In Europe, uh, there's a, a regulatory proposal called Markets and Crypto Assets that uh, in, its, in its current drafting uh, aims to make uh, privacy coins forbidden. You know, if that would be the case, then regulated exchanges could be forced you know, and this is just like my interpretation of it, but, you know, regulated exchanges could be forced to like either refuse deposits from addresses that have uh, interacted with these protocols or or even stop trading uh, privacy coins like Zcash, etc. Do you feel that perhaps protocols like Tornado Cash, you know, in the future could end up in the in the sights of you know, national or supranational regulators that, you know, want to make these kinds of transactions or these kinds of anonymous uh, crypto protocols uh, forbidden? I don't think so because uh, it's very easy for exchange to ask about origin of funds and for user to prove where those funds come from. When user shows the compliance report to an exchange, the funds are no longer private for this exchange. Like They can see where they come from. So I don't see any problems here. Okay, so let's talk about um, the larger ecosystem for a little bit. So basically, if you look at Tornado Cash um, and other privacy preserving solutions, I mean, you've got solutions that have their own blockchains like Zcash and Monero, and then you have things that kind of go on top of Ethereum, um, such as ZK Money. So basically, Tornado, if you look at it, it's a well-designed mixer, but at its core, it's it's a mixer. Um, so basically, if you look at ZK Money, um, which has this ZK, a Zcash like shield, clearly the use cases um, for that are much broader and um, encompass many more things than Tornado does. So my question here is, what does your roadmap look like? Uh, and how do you um, plan to position you, yourself in the new presence of things like ZK Money? I think most solutions uh, move in the similar direction and try to be like similar to Zcash, which was uh, like one of the first uh, researchers in this area. So I, I guess uh, most solutions will look like this. And the original Tornado Cash implementation was the like fast way to do privacy, but in the future it should also be pretty similar, like allow transactions and stuff. And as for separate blockchains, currently Ethereum privacy has lower transaction count, uh, mostly because Ethereum is much more expensive than Monero, for example. But uh, with new releases of layer two technology in this year, uh, this can change. Like mm, the separate blockchains, the only thing they can do is to transfer money privately. But on Ethereum, transferring money privately would be only one of many features in the ecosystem. So I think privacy coins as a separate blockchain is less convenient for most users. So you'll also move in the direction of shields and layer twos, and this is the general direction for Tornado? Yeah. So before we wrap up here, you know, what uh, is on the roadmap here and also where can users learn more about Tornado Cash and perhaps get in involved? Tornado Cash uh, development is in big part is decided by governance and the community. Uh, governance holds more than half of all Torn tokens. And people can get involved by going into forum and participating in discussions and steering Tornado Cash in direction that they think is the best. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Roman. Uh, this was very elucidating. I think privacy is something that gets talked about increasingly more, but I, I think it's it's very necessary that we become more sensitive to these issues. I think uh, like usually what happens is 
people don't much care about privacy until something bad happens and some big service leaks <laughs> some private data and then suddenly people realize uh, that they actually want the privacy. <laughs> Or maybe events similar what happened uh, with uh, Snowden. When someone comes along and actually shows people how important it is, uh, people suddenly start caring about it. I think that's very true. And I think those are great closing words. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Raman. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>